Thank you for tuning in to Exeter TV. The meeting will be starting shortly. While we wait, let's learn more about Exeter TV. Exeter TV is the town's public and government access channels, available on Comcast channels 98 and 22. Channel 98 is your channel. If you have an idea for a program, want to host your own talk show, or submit a film, we're here to get your content on television. On Channel 22, we bring you live and replay coverage of government meetings and other town updates. A third channel, Blue Hawk Media, is operated by SAU 16 and can be found on Channel 13 with all your school sports, events, and meetings. You can watch Exeter TV online at ExeterNH.TV, Apple TV, and on Roku. Find us on social media for extra content. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell to get notified about live streams and new content. Tune in to our platforms every other Friday to watch the Exeter Bi-Weekly Report with recaps of recent events, updates from town departments, and messages from nonprofits in your area. If you head to our website, exeternh.tv, we invite you to sign up to our newsletter to receive monthly updates about new content, upcoming meetings, and more. We'd like to thank you for taking the time to watch Exeter TV and hope that you tune in to our other content as well.
Thank you for tuning in to Exeter TV. The meeting will be starting shortly. While we wait, let's learn more about Exeter TV. Exeter TV is the town's public and government access channels, available on Comcast channels 98 and 22. Channel 98 is your channel. If you have an idea for a program, want to host your own talk show, or submit a film, we're here to get your content on television. Is on channel on? 22. It is, okay, very good. I am uh, Paul Velosage. I am the uh, interim DPW director here in Exeter. And uh, today we're gonna have a little talk given by uh, uh, Kala Matsu. And he is the director of the Piscataqua Region Estuaries Partnership. Uh, so much of what happens here in Exeter uh, affects the health of the Great Bay. Uh, the prep folks find out data and trends and scientific information of what's going on out there. They are not the regulators, they are the information seekers. Uh, so with that, uh, invite uh, Kala up here. Uh, we're scheduled for two hours. Doesn't have to be that long, but we'll take a break in the middle. And um, um, yeah, and there's the bathroom is right here on the first floor, uh, right over there, uh, right across from this room. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Oh, any, any questions that you have, uh, instead of waiting until the end, bring them up while he's on that particular subject also. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thanks for coming, everybody. Um, and I'll try to remember, I, I understand that this is being live streamed, so I'll, I'll try to remember sometimes to refer to anybody who might be watching. And um, I will say at the beginning, if you will be using this report quite a lot, you go to the Scatacua Region Estuaries Partnership, State of Our Estuaries Report, you Google something like that, you will find our State of Our Estuaries 2023 report. Yes, for those who just came in, we do have hard copies of the report as well as a municipal guide and a residence guide. Feel free to grab these and use them as much as you like, and then you can always keep them and take them home or return them if you feel like you're not going to use them. Yes, sir? Just a suggestion. This being a meeting place and being taped, <coughs> you probably should use a microphone. Ah, what do you think, Paul? Is that true? Usually we get people coming out and saying, use the microphone. Oh, really? <laughs> oh. People at home would like to hear what you're saying. Yeah? Mm -hmm. All right. I'd love to roam. It's very difficult. To pick it up. Yeah. You, know, yeah. you, can walk. you can walk around with this thing? Yeah. Go walk with you. Good suggestion. What was your name? Langdon Plummer. Say it again? Langdon Plummer. Thank you, Langdon. Um, so yeah, so find the State of the Estuaries report and um, use that when we refer to certain pages, which we will probably be doing throughout. So uh, my plan is to ask you what you want to know, tell you the sort of the Reader's Digest of what's going on in the minds of myself and my prep colleagues. By the way, we have Trevor Matera here, who is the um, Habitat Program Manager for PrEP. Yay for Trevor. We love Trevor. Um, so Trevor might jump in and help me out at times if I uh, misspeak or forget to say something. So yeah, I'm going to ask you what you want to know, and then I'm going to tell you what we feel is the really the take-home message. And then I'm going to ask you again, is there more do you want to know now that you know what we think is the take-home message? And then I'm going to go through a, um, a little um, a metaphor of how I suggest we look at taking care of our watershed. And then there's about a 20, 25 minute presentation that follows this um, Piscataqua fish story, which you will find on page 10 of the report. So um, the journey through our watershed, a fish story. And the reason for that story is we thought, a lot of times we tend to think of uh, our watershed in a very sort of siloed manner, right? We want to put things in little boxes so that we can understand them better. That's what humans like to do. And the uh, problem is a lot of the ecosystem components don't exist that way. And 
primary of those is, is the river herring. They live a lot of their life in the ocean, a lot of it in the estuary, and a lot of it in the fresh water. So they're a great integrator of everything that's going on. And the estuary is the same way. It's affected by the ocean. It's affected by what's happening upstream. So that's why we thought that would be a good story. We're still trying to listen to people and find out if that's true. So I'm going to stop here and say, what do people want to know? Yes? Yeah, that's Hampton Seabrook Harbor. Yeah, right there. Yeah, where there's some nice uh, clam flats there. Let's see. Yes. Yeah, I, actually, what do people think? Is that true? Because I would have thought it would be more here. But yeah, I think it is that. Yeah. And they are, um, well, I don't want to go on too long until, yes. That, that's, any other questions? Okay. Other, what do people feel like they want to know? If he doesn't answer this today, boy, I'll be a little disappointed. Langdon, and then we'll go to Paul. Uh, give him the microphone. Oh, sure. <laughs> Listen to my own advice. <laughs> this is getting ahead of the game, maybe, but what about the, the impact of the recent stormwater? Is that flushing everything out, or is yeah, will you be getting to that as we progress? I'm just curious about that. All of a sudden, there's this... The extra river swells and, and a lot goes on with it. Yeah, so what's the effect of these big stormwater pushes? Um, most of our understanding is that these big stormwater events, uh, you characterize it as flushing everything out. M most of our understanding is that there's more negative than positive associated with these. So they're br it, it's bringing a lot in. And because uh, we're going to talk later about impervious surfaces, and every year we have more, our watershed has more and more impervious surface. When you get a big stormwater event, more and more stuff just gets washed into our rivers and our estuaries quickly, right? It doesn't have time to infiltrate because we're um, paving over a lot of our open space. So that um, stormwater is maybe the biggest issue, definitely one of the top three, because it brings in a lot of things that we don't like. It brings in nutrients, it brings in sediments, it brings in toxics. It just brings in volume of water. It, and now, as we're seeing, that actually the temperature of water is a problem. So that's going to be warmer water, right, than the nice cool water that comes in through groundwater from bogs and things like that. So it's not a great thing, but it's a huge challenge to study stormwater and capture its impacts. Huge scientific challenge that people are wrestling with. Other uh, questions? Yeah, Mary. Oh, Ma hold on, Mary. I know that you're not in the regulation business, but I am curious about the standards for regulating runoff. Are we using the 100-year flood or 2x the 100-year flood, or is it every five years now? I don't know the answer to that. Um, does anybody else have that information here? Uh, New Hampshire DES is revisiting right now their their stormwater um, standards as the as part of the alteration for terrain permitting process. So I know peak peak runoff is part of it. I don't know where they're at, but they're in the process of you know making sure they account for that right now. So I guess to be determined, but you could ask now and see and try to influence the process, I guess. Yeah. Can I add to that? Oh, please. So um, Exeter, when we have development plans come through, we do use the higher storm, um, storm events in, in the modeling um, for designing stormwater infrastructure. And for projects that do not it, um, meet the AOT threshold, our stormwater regulations do still require that stormwater designs meet AOT standards. Can you say again what AOT means? Sorry, alteration of terrain. Thank you. Yep. Other questions? Yes. Hi, Martha uh, McEntee. I live here in Exeter in the Exeter did you Mill. Sorry? Did you say your name was Martha? Martha, yes. Okay. Yes, I live here on the Exeter Mill, and my family moved up here in the late 1960s from New York, and I've watched with dismay to see the change in the wildlife around here, um, a loss of a lot of birds, 
insects in particular have changed, fewer fireflies, fewer dragonflies. Um, fishing has changed. And my, the local lobster people that we always used to get our lobsters from no longer have their own traps because they don't get enough lobsters off the coast of New Hampshire. They now buy their supply from Maine fishermen further north. And even up in Maine, the lobsters are moving north to Canada with the colder water. Um, that really bothers me. The whole culture of the area is changing. Um, and I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Thank you. It bothers me, too, not only because um, it's lovely to sort of witness and know that these really beautiful food webs are happening, um, but because of their importance. A lot of times we say, like, one thing that comes up a lot is um, seagrass is disappearing and everyone's worried about it, especially because EPA is very worried about it and so is doing a lot of regulation around it. And we tend to think, oh man, without the, without the seagrass, we're not gonna have fish. But the other thing that happens is, is without the fish, we're not gonna have seagrass. It works the other way too. And so whenever we, um, the things that we do start to impact a, a species, there can be unforeseen impacts that make everything else worse. So a great example with the fish is as we have tended to overfish uh, our oceans and near coasts, we do have less fish and some of the invasive uh, species like green crabs have gotten really out of control because we don't have as many cod, salmon, sturgeon to gobble those up. When the crabs get out of control, they devour everything in sight, including all the little insects that live in the sediment and come out on the seagrass blades and graze the algae off. So there's all these, right? So they, they discovered this in Monterey when they, brought the, when they brought the sea otters back, suddenly the seagrass came back because the otters were keeping the crabs in check. So there's all these connections, right? And we tend to think about things very sort of, and that's partly because of the regulatory environment. It's like nitrogen, bad. We don't need to talk about anything else, right? Nitrogen, bad, seagrass, good. And it's just not that simple. And so one message you're gonna hear me say today is we kinda need to do everything we can, basically, because it all matters. Um, that's a, a gross, we, we, need, we should do as much as we can about the things that we know matter and, and wildlife matters. It just does. So, other, Paul. Randy, would you mind handing that? Certainly. Uh, the town uh, over the last few years uh, spent a considerable amount of money, over $50 million updating the wastewater treatment plant and um, the mechanisms to get the flow there. Um, are you noticing any difference? <laughs> so, you know, there's a lot of ways we could notice a difference. You could notice a difference in the amount of uh, nitrogen that is being put into the system. That's called loading. And obviously that has gone down as a result of what the town of Exeter has done, town of Newmarket, now Portsmouth as well. Loading has gone down tremendously in terms of dissolved inorganic nitrogen is down somewhere between 70 and 80% over the last five years because not just the town of Exeter, but other municipalities have done this hard work. And then you say, oh, okay, the loading has gone down. Should we also see a, a decrease in concentration? When we go out and take a water sample, will we see a decrease of, uh, in, in concentration? That's complicated because concentration is really the, what's left over after everything's had dinner. Right After the microbes have eaten, and the plants have eaten, and the seaweed is eaten, and the phytoplankton is eaten, and they use all that nitrogen, they suck it up very quickly, that's what we're sampling. So unless you really understand how all the, uh, the dinner invitees, what they've been up to, nitrogen concentration is a difficult thing to assess the importance of. Having said that, I will show a graph later that shows it has gone down over the last two or three years. And that could be a result of what the town of Exeter has done. Um, but really what we want to know is, how's the patient doing, right? The patient is the watershed. The watershed has these different body components. One of them is 
uh, seagrass, oysters, fish, things like that. Seagrass was doing a little bit better in some areas uh, up until two years ago, and it seemed to have stalled. And this year, we don't have the data yet, but Trevor and I have been spending a lot of time in the water, and it doesn't look good this year. And it's been a very wet and rainy year so far, so that, getting back to your point, Langdon, about precipitation, that could be the issue. So then people say, oh, well, it doesn't do anything, right? Well, I don't know if they say that, but they might think it. And my, my point is always, well, how would things be if we hadn't done that? What would have happened if you hadn't reduced your nitrogen loading and we had all the storm water? It would have been worse. We don't, we do know that too much nitrogen is bad for ecosystems. We just know it. Like, it doesn't have to be proven anymore. So my, my response to you, Paul, is, it has done good, and it will continue to do good. What we don't know is, are we going to be able to see it? Because there are so many things going on with climate change and other stressors, it could mask the signal, the response signal of the good that you've done. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's very hard to tease this out. And that's a big message from today. We have to do this science, because we have to make sure there's no surprises, but we're not going to... There's not going to be any big aha moment like at the end of an Agatha Christie movie. It's just not going to happen. Aha, it was nitrogen. Aha, it was uh, color dissolved organic matter. It's just not going to happen. It's all that stuff all the time. And it switches while we're here right now, it's changing. So what you measured last year becomes a little less relevant. But we do still need to do the science, but we can't rely on that to make our decisions. It's absolutely necessary. It's not sufficient by itself. You also need to, your values, honestly, your risk threshold. Where do you want to take the risk? Other thoughts, questions? Yes, sir. Uh, Jake Jackman, Ray Pierce. Um, I just had a question. Just flipping through your state of our estuaries, 2023, a lot of science, as you mentioned. Um, curious, how, how do you take the science and the data that you're gathering and take it to the next step in terms of like action. Is this is the goal to influence regulatory uh, requirements and processes or is it to open up different funding opportunities um, to benefit the watershed? Maybe, maybe it's just a, a topic to keep in mind as we're, we're discussing today, but um, curious to hear more on that. Such a good question. Say your name again. Jake, Jake, such a great question. Um, and this would get to the first thing I said I was going to do was to suggest a metaphor for how to approach this. And the metaphor I suggest, I've been doing this now for eight years. I wouldn't have suggested this when I started in 2015. In 2015, I would have said, well, do the science and find the answer. And now, eight years later, I'm like, oh. I understand, right? And I'm hearing from a lot of scientists who have a lot more experience than I do that we need to be a lot more humble in our ability to predict what's going to happen and why those things are happening. Um, and, and so, again, the metaphor I suggest to all of you, and this is, I think, a starting point to answer your question, is you have a loved one who has an undiagnosed illness. Right? You're not sure what's going on. It could be chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, Lyme, some weird neuro You just don't know. And the reason this metaphor really works for me is I've been in this situation with a loved one. And yet, medical science is incredible, just like ecological science. Like, it's really incredible what we can do and what we can know. And yet, we're still confronted in a situation like I was in a hospital in Boston where they look at you after doing the best blood test that money can buy, and they look at you and they say, I don't know. I don't know. So what are you going to do? So that's when you start to backtrack. You say, OK, this is what the science is for. We know this. We know that. We know that this could be an issue, right? We're not seeing anything to contradict this major theory about how nitrogen affects um, eelgrass or how harvesting affects oysters, all right? So we're basically trying to feed a mental model of people trying to understand how to keep their, their watershed healthy in a situation where it has 
an, a, a, an undiagnosed illness. The diagnosis broadly is, of course, that population continues to go up and building goes up and impervious cover goes up, more pollution, but we also have climate change. So all these things are happening at once. We want to find one or two particular suspects or assailants, and I just don't think it's gonna happen. Um, and so the, the reason we're doing the science is to show people and to say, we're, we're studying this as hard as we can, and here are the main stories that we have seen from all over the world. You bring down nutrients, you bring down sediments. Those of you who have a uh, municipal guide, you can open that up to this great action table. Buffers and setbacks, what can you do? Buffers and setbacks. Land conservation, septic systems, stormwater management, climate resilience. We know these things are gonna benefit the environment. That's not in dispute. What people want to know is how much, right? That's the big question with nitrogen and seagrass. Okay, we get it, we get it, right? We have too much nitrogen. Tell us exactly how much because we don't wanna do any more work than we have to. And I don't, I don't say that in a derogatory way. I mean, towns have really a lot going on in addition to the environment, right? They've gotta take care of a lot of things. They've got schools, law enforcement, um, taking care of all the roads. And they have, to, they have to make their budgets work. So I get that people are like, well, what do we have to do? But the answer is not gonna be clear. We're not gonna be able to say. I'm, I'm telling you the bad news right now. Everybody wants a number. How much, what, what's the right number for nitrogen loading? We don't know. And, and honestly, if I didn't know, it might change in four or five years because everything's changing all the time. So again, bring yourself back to having a, a loved one with an undiagnosed illness. In those situations, you do the work, you find out, right? In my situation, not for me, but for my loved one, okay, we know that diet is gonna be a big part of this. We know the amount of exercise and stress, these are the, gonna be the big things. And so you go after the things you know matter and you keep going after it until you can see a result. And I know that sounds way overly simplified, but um, we can get into the details. But I think it's important that we don't oversell our ability to be surgical in our response to these ecosystem problems. This is not engineering. We are not building a bridge where we can say, okay, we want it to last for 30 years. It's got to withstand this kind of tonnage. That's not what we're dealing with. We're dealing with what's called a wicked problem. Okay, and a wicked problem means is it's very hard to decide when, it's e when the problem is even solved, right? We would all probably disagree about how much seagrass we even want. We had, in 1996, we had 2,900 acres. Some people say, I want that again, and I wanna go above that, because I know we had more than that back in the 70s and the 60s. Other people will say, I don't want 2,900 acres of seagrass. It gets in my propeller and screws things up and I don't ever see it and I don't care about it. Why isn't 2,000 acres enough, right? So these are wicked societal problems. But, so, so um, we're trying to affect regulation to your question, but we're also trying to affect essentially the people who come to people like Paul and others who work for towns who are looking for a signal. What's important to you? Right, that's why they put it up to a vote when you did the wastewater treatment plant. And you, you got a clear response from that vote. And so one thing we we're really concerned about is we want the citizenry to have as much of these facts as possible so that they can go to the municipalities and say, okay, we understand that the science can't tell us what to do, but we're gonna tell you where our values are, where we wanna take the risk. And that's why we're doing the science but not just science. A big part of our program is not having anything to do with science at all. It's about communications, about technical uh, assistance and things like that. Did I answer your question? Okay. Other questions? Yes? One thing about engineering, they, one thing about engineering is they don't know what to do often and they end up overbuilding and unfortunately sometimes underbuild. They don't know the answers either. I'm not an engineer, so I'm not feeling threatened by your statement. Um, other questions before I present you with a little bit more information which might stimulate other questions? 
Yes, Langdon. How about dam removals? The state's been working, <coughs> excuse me, hard on removing dams. Now, hard here I'm talking about Manchester area, but we, we had a lengthy process before the people decided it was time to take the old dam down for a good reason. So that's going to have some effect on Well, I mean, um, obviously there are concerns around dam removal. If you have a, a backlog of sediment that's just sitting there and then you remove it, what's going to happen with the sediment? But overall, PrEP, it's a case-by-case -case basis, but mostly PrEP is behind dam removal because, again, uh, what you're going to hear about when I give my presentation, which is based on a presentation that a fish biologist gave at the State of the Estuaries, um, Dams also, they stop all the water, which makes the water warmer, which makes the water um, have less dissolved oxygen. So back to Martha's wildlife question, you know, we need to keep things uh, circulating as best as possible. And, and dams just make that hard. They make it hard from a sort of a hydrologic standpoint. And of course, they just make it hard for the fish. I mean, fish sliders only work for some species. American shad do not do fish ladders. And because of that, we, we have seen shad basically disappear from all of our rivers, but now they're starting to come back. I think they're starting to see them here in Exeter, um, and they haven't seen them in a long time. But now because you removed your dam, people are starting to see shad again. And of course, your river herring counts are through the roof, which you, there's a graph here to, to talk about. And it's also in your report. There's a, a section on that. So did I answer your question? Yeah. Great. Other questions? Um, I guess, you know, you asked me a lot of the questions that, so I don't have to go into, let me just restate the take home message. You walk away with, with only a couple of things today. The patient is the watershed. You want to know what the watershed looks like? Go to page four. That's your Piscataqua region watershed. Any drop of water falls in that boundary, 42 towns in New Hampshire, 10 in Maine, it flows downhill into the Great Bay Estuary or the Hampton Seabrook Estuary. Do you Paul. have that on your slide? I do not have okay. that on a slide, no. So folks at home, you can go and look on the report. Um, there's another watershed picture I have later on a slide. Um, so that's your watershed, okay? And we use the estuary to understand how the watershed's doing. And if you now go to page, and sorry, Paul, I don't have a slide for this, these indicators either, but if you go to page nine of your report, you're gonna see all the indicators we track. And we've, brought, we've broken them into broad categories. Doing good, cautionary, some good, some bad. That's what cautionary means in red. It's just bad. And even though we've got oysters and seagrass are in the orange circle there, so cautionary, there's part of me that says, no, they should be in the red, right? Because we've lost over 80% of our oysters from 1993. And we're about 50% down on seagrass. The reason we put them in cautionary is that we have been seeing some, gl some glimmers of hope lately. And we felt we needed to honor that. But the fact of the matter is, when you've got this many of your indicators in cautionary, think again, if this were your body, right? These were your vital signs. You'd be like, oh, I'm not doing well, doc, right? And that's where the watershed is. It is not doing well. It's struggling. There's glimmers of hope, right? The fish counts are up high, mostly because of the dam removal in Exeter. Um, oyster counts are higher than they've been in 20 years because of a lot of the work that Trevor and, and Ray Grizzle from UNH are doing to restore um, oysters. Folks from Nature Conservancy as well. But mostly the patient is struggling. That's, so that's, that's number one. So the second thing is, okay, well, what do we do about it? And now I return you to this. We should do as much as we can on the things that we know are good for the environment. Because these are just investments. Like This is like putting money in a 529 plan for your kids. People want to say, oh, oh that we don't have, I get it. But let's figure out a way to get the money, right? Let's, talk, let's take money out of this just for a second and just say, and this is what you do when you go to the doctor's office, okay? 
I don't make you know a million dollars a year, but you're saying my loved one is sick. What do we need to do? And so if you take money out of it, I will tell you what we need to do is be incredibly aggressive on protecting our watershed in every way we can. That's just the science. And we're not going to know if we've overprotected uh, for a long, long time. Because the problem is, as much as we are doing, and we are doing so much good work, and Town of Exeter are doing so much good work, as are other towns, the stressors just keep coming, right? The climate is doing crazy stuff. So now we have the Gulf of Maine is warming faster than 99.8% of the rest of the planet, OK? Water temperature going up, yes, and it screws up a lot. And we can talk about that later. These storms and more precipitation patterns, right? All these things are making it very difficult. So we have to do, we have to control everything we can control to compensate for the things we can't control. And that's a statement that is in the beginning of the fish story. And that is my big take home message. And it may seem unscientific. I've had people tell me, look me in the face and say, that's wishy washy, that's not scientific. But to me, it's not scientific to not say that because it is backed by data. Now, I can't tell you exactly what's going to happen or what we need to do. That would, to me, that would be unscientific. And to do nothing because we don't have a 95, we haven't reached some statistical 95% threshold of being sure about the data is scientifically irresponsible because there's just way too much variables out there to reach that kind of statistic. If any of you do statistics, you know the thing that hurts your 95% threshold is variability in the data set. And Trevor and I spend a lot of time out there. It is damn variable, OK? So it's hard to prove exactly what's going on. That's why people do these small tests and mesocosms and things like that. And that's how we know, oh, too much nitrogen, bad for seagrass, too much harvesting, bad for oysters, disease because of warm water, bad for oysters, OK? So we have to be very aggressive to protect our environment. We have to decide that it matters, and we have to tell our municipal representatives that's how we feel. We know the science can tell us exactly what to do. In the interim, we are telling you as citizens, this, to us, the science shows that we need to be very aggressive. That's a take-home message. And with that, I can switch to uh, some, some slides that I can show you. But if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to pause. <laughs> Thank you, Dick, for leading that applause. Um, okay, so let's get into it. Um, and and uh, I'm going to give you a break because I'm really good about honoring breaks. But if you're feeling like uh, you're waiting too long for a break, call it, raise your hand, and we can do that. So. I included this slide because, it, it, to me, it evoked the, 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 the tragedy of the commons, which is this old concept of how hard it is for a society to take care of public resources. Um, you got this little pasture here. You can imagine everyone putting their cows out on the pasture, and then the grass goes away, and people are like, oh, there's only a limited amount of grass, so I could put my more of my cows out there quick to gobble it up. It's just the point with this slide is to say taking care of the watershed is one of the most challenging things we can do as a society. Because who owns it? It's very, very complicated. I've talked a lot about don't wait for science to tell you what to do. This is the biggest point of my career. And I did my PhD on this. And so I love this paper. And you can take a picture of it if you want or email me. But it says, it, it outlines very clearly how we hurt ourselves. We hurt ourselves, we hurt our budgets, we hurt the environment by waiting for science to tell us exactly what to do. It's not going to happen, especially with something as complex as ecosystems. And this was just to remind me that if, in some cases, you do everything you know is good for the patient, the patient can get off the couch and walk the beach again. And that's basically what that slide is reminding me to tell you. And that every, all of us just have to do that work. Think about the watershed as a loved one with an undiagnosed illness and do the work to protect the environment. And it's up to us, right? No one else is going to do it. 
lovely photo from Emily Lord. Um, this is just a reminder. I've said that the patient is sick. One of the reasons it's hard to get mo people motivated to work on this patient is that the patient looks pretty good, right? It's like if we went to a college reunion and you saw me, you hadn't seen me in 20 years, I'm walking across some hall and you're like, hey, he looks pretty good. Then you follow me outside and I'm just like, you know, I wanted to look good for you because I haven't seen you in 20 years and I can hold it together for a while. And that's a little bit like our system. It looks beautiful. If you scuba dive in our system, as I do, and Trevor spends a lot of time underwater as well, and I've been doing this since the late 90s, I've seen a lot of change, okay? If, if this is how it looked in the late 90s, this is how it looks now, okay? It's bent over, there's a lot less seagrass, there's a lot less oysters, the, there's a lot less light penetration from when I was here in the late 90s. But it looks beautiful from your car, so why should we get involved, right? That's part of the problem. But let's take a second to celebrate how beautiful our patient is. About four minutes of celebration.
part that I think the answer is you got to get your scuba gear going and get underwater and see all that water. Well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so the reason we're concerned is because it doesn't always look right. We cherry picked all the beautiful scenes there, but all that beautiful eelgrass you saw was out at um, Portion Park, where the water is much clearer because it's you know it's diluted by the ocean. The sediment out there is like really coarse sand. And so it doesn't get stirred up as well. Now in Great Bay, it's like sticking your hand into cement that's about to set, you know, with this clay. And so it's different, and that's what it looks like here. And, and you can see in this video, there's a lot of epiphytes, that stuff growing on the leaves. Oh, thank you. A lot of epiphytes growing on the leaves. It's hard to see. I'm a little color challenged, but to me it looks a little brown and a little green. Is that what you guys are seeing? Yeah. yeah. So if it's mostly brown, it's mostly total suspended solids. If it's mostly green, it's going to be mostly phytoplankton. Both of those things block light, in addition to color dissolved organic matter. Uh, and then that makes it hard for things like seagrass to photosynthesize. Um, Trevor's very familiar with that, what I'm holding there. That's an invasive uh, seaweed called Gracilaria vermiculophytum. It's, there's so much of it out there. This didn't exist in the late 90s. Um, and this is especially a problem in Great Bay, less of a problem in the Piscataqua River and in Portsmouth Harbor. But in Great Bay, every year there's that, and then there's some new weird invasive, yucky seaweed um, that, again, we didn't have 20 years ago. Uh, and you're going to see it here. See how See how there's, the bottom is all of that gracilaria? It's, and it's swamping out that. And then this is some weird cyanobacteria yuck. And you're going to see my hand touch it, because I was like, what is that? And it actually, you have to kind of break through it. Now, we're not seeing a lot of that, and I'm very thankful for that. but. What we are seeing a lot of is that gracilaria in the back. All that stuff, we're seeing tons of that. Seaweed does not need much light. What it needs is nitrogen. Eelgrass is the opposite. It needs lots and lots of light, and it actually doesn't need any nitrogen at all in the water column. How can that be? How can, a, how can any living organism survive without nitrogen? It gets it from its roots. So th that's the big competitive fight between seaweed and seagrass. Seagrass growing very well in Greenland where there is almost, un you can't even measure the amount of nitrogen up in Greenland, the continent, right? But seagrass is doing well there. How? Because it harvests whatever little nitrogen it needs through the sediment, okay? And then of course seaweed loves warm temperature and seagrass does not. Sorry to just throw this slide at you, but I wanted to show you that some other bad things are happening. Salt marsh sparrows are, are drowning because we have sea level rise. Uh, and so this one sparrow to the left is already uh, drowned. And this is a very, very big issue for an incredibly important habitat. Salt marshes are extremely important. Um, the good news is, is when you look at this really great section on salt marshes, um, Trevor, maybe you could just shot out the page. It's a beautiful section on salt marsh done by our friends at Great Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve. And what you see is that the marshes around here are quite stable. Page 34. Page 34, everybody. It's a really amazingly done section on salt marshes, but it's a big problem. Sometimes they look beautiful. They look the way they're supposed to look. Sometimes you see mosquito ditches. Right, which was done uh, throughout the 20th century, either um, for agricultural purposes or because we were trying to kill mosquitoes. And that totally screws up the hydrology and amplifies the problems associated with sea level rise. This is up watershed, um, presented by my colleague John Balanoff. So looking at areas where they're not dealing with coastal issues, they're dealing with lakes, and they're seeing tons of erosion. Um, having to do with camp roads and things like that. 
Erosion is really bad for the lakes and for in terms of water quality, so they're really, and sometimes they have phosphorus problems and they get cyano, cyanobacteria outbreaks and things like that. That matters to us, right? They, they, don't, they don't care about eelgrass and oysters, but we care about their water quality because it flows downhill. More algae problems. And now um, I was gonna stop and transition to um, the fish story presentation. Why don't we just take a quick five minute break? Just, uh, it's always good to stand up and shake your head a little bit and then uh, go back into listening mode in, in say five minutes. Does that sound good? Okay. And there's food. Trisha, right? Brought food. Have you brought it, yeah, Paul? Yeah, there's snacks and water. Snacks and water. I shouldn't oversell it. Snacks and water. <laughs> sure.
I'm just going to guess that it has. Kristen Murphy's giving me the thumbs up. So uh, if you wouldn't mind finding your seats again, and we'll get started. Hey, Mary, you want to grab some folks and pull them back with you? Some folks? Some folks. Any folks will do. Yeah. Uh, so the question was, what um, commercial operation perhaps could be done to harvest the seaweed? And um, <laughs> who asked that? Yeah, yeah. Um, do you have do you have thoughts on that, Trevor? I mean, I, I Trevor and I are very excited. <laughs> We're very excited about the idea because there's so much of it out there, and I know that people use seaweed for compost. Uh, or, or for um, their gardens and things like that. So it, it feels like there's something there. Um, no, I, I've looked, every now and then I'll look for some business model example of that and I'm not seeing it. I'm surprised. Um, but I think it's a great, it's a great question. And uh, the seagrass expert who has now retired and moved to Seattle, Fred Short, he used to always say, we should do exactly what you just said. Let's harvest it and use it for gardens. So, and again, I want to tell, I want to clarify, and you can, um, Trevor, if you wouldn't mind telling me the page number for the seaweeds. Uh, the seaweed section is another good section, and um, it's really important to let everybody know that it, it, it's coming off like I don't like seaweed. I, I do like seaweed. I don't like the I invasive subtitle variety. Uh, I like, I really like the kind that are uh, like rockweed. Um, in the intertidal provides lots of excellent habitat for juvenile mussels, juvenile oysters, lots of fish, especially at high tide. But it's the stuff that's just sort of floating out and competing out in the subtitle uh, that's causing lots of problems up and down the coast. Um, it's, it's not even attached, right? Most seaweed is attached. It uses um, a, like a suction, what's called a hold fast. This stuff is just floating around. And it, it get, it's really uh, a problem. And I, don't, I think it's of limited habitat value. What page? 54. 54. So we talk about the different, you know, what kind of seaweeds we're, we were liking and not. Um, before I start the presentation, um, um, at the risk of overpraising Trevor, I want to point you to the Piscataqua Watershed Data Explorer. If you're the type of person who wants to very quickly access data, this is a completely new resource that Trevor spearheaded. And just Google Piscataqua data, Piscataqua Watershed Data Explorer. It'll be, if you put in all four of those words, it'll be your first result. And um, this is actually live. So like uh, Paul asked me, well, are we seeing any results from the wastewater treatment upgrade? So you can just go there. And I, if it were me, I would go over to this station, which is the Squamscott station. I uh, click on that pops up here. I'm interested in, I would be mostly interested in dissolved inorganic. So maybe this one. And you can view in full screen. And I would say that in the last few years, things are looking a little bit better than they were in the years previous to that. Um, and maybe even better than these years here, which were Incredibly rainy, remember? 2006 was the Mother's Day storm. So you saw how quickly I accessed that data. I was able to blow it up and look at it big. You can download it into a CSV file. There's so much you can do with this, and it's still in beta. Is it beta? We're calling it beta? So if you play with it and you get frustrated for any reason, just talk to Trevor, because <laughs> he's, actually, he's actually looking for feedback. <laughs> Sounds like I'm throwing him under the bus, but I mean, he's actually looking for feedback. Um, so you can do, look, look at lots of different things here. You can pull up um, layers like uh, you want to know where the seagrass was in 2010. Um, you can zoom in on that, see where the seagrass was. Um, there's also maps from 2019 you can compare. You can do lots of cool stuff, and it's just going to get better and better. And there's lots and lots of data. You can compare. You can put up two stations and compare them. Um, you can look at um, or two parameters versus each other. How is turbidity affecting light attenuation? Things like that. So please check that out. 
And appreciations to Trevor for making that happen. Um, yay. So, uh, all right. So, um, the fish story, which starts there on page 10. I asked a really amazing biologist at UNH, um, Nathan Fury, to talk to us about fish and really use that fish story that you have in your report as his anchor. And this is what uh, he came up with. If you were at the conference, you saw him deliver this, and I'm gonna do a, uh, um, a slightly less excellent job than he did, but. Um, so the focus of that story is river herring. Um, these are the main migratory fish that we are, we are tracking. Um, they're actually, when we refer to, um, again, apologies, especially to this woman in, who's in front of me for a gruesome image. I surprised her with the drowning bird, and now I throw another gruesome image at her. But you actually sometimes have to cut open these fish to actually be able to tell a, a blueback from an alewife. And so to, collectively, they're called river herring. And um, this is just to show you that this is not just, this is happening a lot of, a lot of places, right? If you look at American Shad and River Herring commercial landings, um, um, I believe this is the uh, east, east coast of the United States. You can just see how things have, have gone. So our record reflects some of this trend that you see here. But here's specific to our situation. And what you see is that, yeah, it went down, 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 down. But in 2021, we're higher than at any point since 1993. And most of that comes from Exeter, right? So that's this, this blue, this blue bar is all Exeter. Um, and uh, Kachiko was doing well for a while, but now they've had some troubles with their fish ladder. So again, fish ladders don't always work, right? So uh, this is great. The more fish we have, um, that's a really important part of our ecosystem, as, as I discussed in response to Martha's question earlier. So it's really fan this is really fantastic. But overall, the overall picture, it hasn't been a great one. It's been going down, down, down. And so the really amazing thing about these, these fish is that they really do incorporate everything. They force you to think about what's happening in the ocean. They spawn way up high in the freshwater. They make their way out, to, and they live in the estuary for about a year. Then they go and they live in the ocean for two or three years. They make their way back up and spawn again in the, in the freshwater. So they integrate the whole system. And that's why I think they're such a great model for us. And who doesn't love fish? So talking about this part, especially right now, the migration begins. And when they go up to spawn, these pictures from Tim Briggs at, at uh, UNH Sea Grant, um, are, you can kind of see in the background where they are, where all these fish are hanging out. They are literally hanging out in your backyards. And that's why it's so important that those of us who live a little bit further from the estuary are really doing a good job to take care of and do buffers, conserve land, manage stormwater, because these critters are out there, they're laying these eggs, and when they hatch, they're very sensitive. And we need to protect them so that they can make it back out and feed those beautiful whales that we sometimes go and check out. Of course, they have to navigate with dams, but um, we have seen some, some dam removals. Uh, and although they're obviously, it's not an easy decision to make, um, we do believe that that is going to help migratory fish. And then that, in turn, is going to help other things. And again, you're talking about not just the fish, but the water quality around the fish. When you create these impoundments, the water just sits there. It gets hot, the dissolved oxygen goes way, way down, creates lots and lots of problems. Problems for, for, for those things that feed on the fish, too. Getting back to Martha's question, where are the, why aren't we seeing as many birds as we used to see, or other things that eat fish? So now getting back to, okay, they're hatching. And this is just to show you that, you know, we talk about the estuary a lot, and Gabe showed me how to use this little button here. So we, we're you know, interested in the estuary here and also Hampton Seabrook down here. But look at how much of the watershed, the size of this watershed compared to the area that we focus on, that my group focuses on because of the estuarine focus. But we really need to take care of all of this if we care about this, right? And we are so lucky, as that video sh earlier showed you, is that we still have so much that we can protect. Not everybody's in this situation, right? 
There's a, there's a lot of people who just, they just built and built and built and they don't have this anymore. I come from a place like that. It's called Southern California. And that's why I live here now. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I mean, some of the areas are not quite as pristine and that's why we have to give a lot of thought to how we can make them less impactful. A lot of the areas are quite, quite beautiful. But population continues to grow. It stalled uh, during the Great Recession. Is that what we called it in 2008, the Great Recession? It stalled a little bit, population for the first time in the record, but now it's starting to move up again. And every year we have more people in our area. And that's why impervious cover is such an important issue. And unfortunately, this was the first year that Exeter, you can see Exeter here, has become Again, I'm color challenged. I would call that orange or tan or something. But it's now above 10% impervious cover in Exeter. And in the water quality science world, 10% is a well-known threshold for you've now gone past a place where you were definitely going to see lots and lots of water quality problems once you get over 10% impervious cover. And earlier thresholds are as low as 3 to 5%. So you can actually start to see problems at 3 to 5%. So once you get to 10%, you're like, that's a very clear threshold, right? So impervious cover is an issue, right? And there's things we can do about it. Um, I was talking to Mary before we started, and she comes from Oregon, and they have a really interesting law in Eugene where if you're going to redevelop, you have to, re you have to develop to much better standards than had existed before. So the cost is borne by the developer. And you would, uh, for example, have to say, no, all water that falls on this property has to re be retained on property, right? You have to build, because we have the technology to do this. We have the technology to do, to, to retain storm water and filter it before it gets sloshed into the estuary. So now they're going to start making their way out to the estuary. That's how big they are. When they first go down and the uh, Squamscott turns into the Exeter, or is it the other way around? Exeter turns into the Squamscott, and then, you know, go past Chapman's Landing, and then go into the Great Bay. That's how big these fish are. And so they really need habitat. They need complex structure to survive, because they're small. They're going to get chomped, right? Now, that's why salt marshes are so important, especially when they're flooded. When they're flooded at high tide, they can go in there and they can find, they can hide. So this is the, the concept of a nursery, right? Estuaries are known for being nursery habitats. And they can go in there, they can hide, and they can find food. Now all the water goes out. Every six hours the water goes out. Now where are they going to go? What's the next habitat they can go to? Oysters and eelgrass, of which back in 93, it was pretty much everywhere in the estuary, but not so much now. Oh, this was, we already talked about this and how you can actually see there's a little bar graph in the report that shows that the salt marshes around here are actually relatively stable compared to a lot of the other salt marshes, which is great news from a sea level rise standpoint. So we were just talking about eelgrass and oysters. Eelgrass has gone down about 50%. There is one nice little story is that in Portsmouth Harbor area, the trend since about 2010 actually looks to be better. As a eelgrass person, I've run my theory by other eelgrass experts, and they say, yeah, that makes sense. They're not saying you're right, but it makes sense. And the theory is that Portsmouth Harbor, because it has that really coarse sand, it's not going to hold on to nitrogen and organic matter as long as the Great Bay sediment is going to. So a lot of times people will tell you, if you address a nitrogen problem, depending on the sediment, it could take you 10 to 20 years for all that nitrogen to work itself out of the system. Right? As it starts to disappear from the water column, the pressure gradient changes and it starts to seek, seep out of the sediments into the water column. And so we might have a big backlog of nitrogen to work ourselves out of in the Great Bay. But in Portsmouth Harbor, it doesn't, the, the, the sand is so coarse it doesn't hold on. Maybe we're seeing a recovery. That's a big maybe. It could be related to something else. But that, 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 that does make sense. But I am not here pushing a nitrogen story, okay? Nitrogen is important. It's definitely important. It's not the only story in eelgrass loss. 
Okay. Oysters. Those herring need to go and find oysters. In 1993, we had 26 million oysters in the estuary. Uh, in 2005, 2010, we were down to 2 million. 26 million to 2 million. Now we're back up to 5 million. Um, so that's one of the nice glimmers of hope. And oysters are, what they filter the water, right? They're incredible, and they taste good. And they provide great habitat for fish, so the more we can do. Everything helps everything. Oysters help seagrass, seagrass help oysters, they both help fish, vice versa. Here's where a lot of the, the reefs are, um, both natural and restored. Um, we're also seeing a lot of um, aquaculture, and those aquacultured oysters are also filtering until they're harvested. This is Hampton Seabrook. Both of those pictures are from Hampton Seabrook. But there's something like 25 licenses uh, operating in Great Bay right now. And um, there's, a, there's as many oysters being farmed as exist in the wild population. So that's a really great thing. Total suspended solids. This is something that the fish have to deal with because now they can't see, right? If this gets too bad, now they're not gonna be able to see to find their food. On the other hand, they can maybe use it to hide from stripers and stuff like that. The problem is total suspended solids, if it gets too high, as in over here, it could get so high that the oysters basically say, I'm not gonna feed anymore because all I'm getting is sediment. And I'm, I'm spending so much energy dealing with the sediment because every time a piece of sediment goes into an oyster, it surrounds it with this mucus and ejects it as, best word of the day, pseudo feces. And that takes a lot of energy. So if they're gonna get too much of that, they're just gonna stop feeding, right? So it's bad for oysters. It's bad for seagrass because seagrass, as we discussed earlier, needs light. And everybody agrees that we have, what well, people have argued about the nitrogen issue, we, everyone agrees we have a, t a TSS issue. The problem is, why? Do we have it because we lost all the seagrass and the oysters and now you get a little wind and everything just starts to blow and that's why we have high TSS counts? Or is it because it's all coming down the rivers because we're doing too much construction and too much impervious cover? Most of the scientists I talk to think it's mostly because we've lost all the habitat. And so the best thing we can do about TSS, in addition to stormwater management, is try to do everything we possibly can to bring back the eelgrass and the oysters because they settle everything down. You need that structure. So this is showing how there is a, this is at Adams Point, and you're seeing that there's definitely an increasing trend in total suspended solids. I think I included a graph, this is, um, this graph represents at the Squamscot, right at the mouth of the Squamscot. Um, mouth, did I, do it, did I do it right this time? It's the Squamscot, right. So um, this is confusing and disappointing to me. Uh, when was the uh, wastewater treatment upgrade, Paul, 2020? Uh, 1920, yeah. Yeah, 2019 or 2020. So when um, Portsmouth did their update, not only did nitrogen go way down, but people oftentimes forget that when you upgrade your treatment plant, TSS goes way down because you're just holding on to the water a lot more. And they basically went, Portsmouth went from an effluent that looked like this to looking like drinking water. And I don't know if that's the same here. I would have to talk to Paul or somebody who works for Paul, but I'm surprised that this number, it, it looks like it's going up. Now we don't have 2022 data yet, but um, so I, I'm not sure what that's about. And again, it might not have to do with the source and what's coming down. It might have more to do with, well, how are the habitats doing in that area? Um, and because as we lose seagrass, as we lose oysters, you are gonna have higher TSS counts when you go out there. So, complicated. What year was that Portsmouth data that you're referring to? That was like, he, it was the first year. He showed, Terry Damaris, who was running the plant at that time, he has since left Portsmouth, um, he had showed about five months after that plant was online. This, this, these pictures are not from Portsmouth. No, yeah, I was just curious what year. Yeah. So, um, oh, when, when their upgrade was? Yeah. Uh, their upgrade was 2020. Yeah, yeah. A uh, question from Mary, do you wanna grab the microphone? Yeah. Quick description of how the new system 
eliminates or reduces the TSS? Yeah, I'm going to have to turn to Paul. Can you answer that? No? Okay. Well, I'm sorry. Does anybody understand how wastewater treatment plants work? Okay. Yeah, I don't know. I know how, I, I know a little bit about how they use microbes to bring um, the uh, biological oxygen demand down. I, I know less about why, I think it, they're just holding onto it and slowly filtering it out. So, but I don't know more than that. Apologies. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Holding it on for longer periods of time. That's what happens when you go from, um, you know, either, you know, secondary to tertiary or a more advanced secondary system. Portsmouth was at primary. So, so that was a big jump from, for Portsmouth, and maybe there wouldn't be as much of a difference for, um, for Exeter. Um, this is the data that I showed you before. You can see it, um, well, that I showed you with the Data Explorer. And what you do see is that dissolved inorganic N has gone down over the last three or four years at the mouth of the Squamscott. And that could be a response to all the good work at the wastewater treatment plant. Possible. So again, less habitat. When we've lost all the seagrass, we've lost all these oysters. Back in the day, early 90s, those fish could basically make their way all the way out to the coast with maybe 90% of their trip, they were under cover of either oysters or seagrass. Not the case anymore. Now they have long stretches where they're basically just out in, and it's just bare sediment, right? And like sort of tumbleweeds of sea, seaweed going by. The other issue that I brought up is temperature. For the very first time, we now have clear evidence, because everybody knew this was happening out in the Gulf of Maine, but we thought, hoped that we were sort of being insulated from this temperature rise in the estuary. And what you see, this is at Adams Point, so pretty far up the estuary, and what you see is that we have um, a significant increase in temperature. And I even have data, if you go to the eelgrass, sorry to, to make you do this, Trevor, can you tell us the eelgrass page? If you go to the eelgrass page, you're gonna see data that actually tracks high resolution temperature data. And what you see is that, 58. page 58, what you see is that for a week at a time, the temperature is above 25 degrees Celsius. And that's a threshold for seagrass will start to die off when it's above 25 degrees Celsius. It essentially, it overworks itself. It's over, it's over photosynthesizing to the point where it can't keep up with itself and it starts to die. So again, people who want to say nitrogen is the only problem for seagrass, uh-uh. There's a lot of other problems. But that's why we focus on the one that we can control. The ones, not the only one. So Nathan here is talking about metabolism and fish. Fish are um, cold-blooded. If the water warms up, their bodies warm up. If their bodies warm up, their metabolism increases. If their metabolism increases, they need more food to stay alive. Well, but we, they have less food than they used to. That's a problem. They're getting pinched. So again, that's not the fault of the municipalities. It's not your fault. It's not my fault. It's climate change, which I guess you could say is our fault. But because of that problem, it makes it more important that we control the things we can control, because this is an additional stressor that's very difficult to control, right? So at some point, they grow, they grow, they grow, and then they just stop feeding. And it's the same with seagrass. So what do we do? We identify upstream, and I would say downstream as well, opportunities, and we act. This gets back to my main take-home point. Do what you can for the things that we know are good. Whether or not we're going to be able to see the signal, I don't know that we're going to see the signal because the, the system is so complex. Um, this is showing all the dam removals that have happened over the last 10 years, something like that, 20 years, 34 years. Um, so lots and lots of dam removals. Those are, those are helpful, again, for connectivity. This is showing conservation. That, that's our whole watershed right there. Right now, 18.1% of our watershed is in conservation. We have a colleague named Corey Riley. She runs the Great Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve, and she always says the absolute best thing we can do is conserve land because it will treat your water for you, right? And you don't have to pay people to do it. So conserve as much land as we can. Now, I know that's a big issue. Trevor talked to me about how that's a big issue 
in Exeter doing a lot of amazing conservation, but we also have development pressure, and those two things, those are difficult to negotiate. So this is from the fish story section. I think that's going to be on page 11 or 12. And this is just trying to move us away from this notion of we, we can decide as a, like a surgeon exactly which button to push. We know exactly how this system works like, right, because some, somebody can build an amazing model and every, mo every component of your ecosystem has a mathematical number that goes with it. Well, you can build that and that can be helpful. But all, as they say, all models are wrong, some are useful, right? And so trying to get away from this, oh, we can, we can dial in exactly the right everything, is no, let's not look at it that way. Let's build up a wide portfolio of assets because we don't know what's coming around the bend. What if we have another Mother's Day storm like 2006 where the, the salinity in the Great Bay was reduced to zero for two weeks, right? We have to prepare for bad news because we live in a very unstable world. So how do we do that? We do that by addressing impervious cover, by conserving land, by having good buffers, all the things that are in your municipal guide. And so as you move here, you build up assets. If your stressors continue to go up, but you have really strong assets, you will at least be fair, if not good. If you don't have a lot of assets and then this happens, you're gonna be in the red square. Again, it may seem vague to you, but I would say to, to get more specific than the science can actually do is, is not responsible. And that's the end of my presentation. We can take some questions. I do want to, um, I do want to um, address a few things that Paul had asked me about. Um, let's see. Paul had asked me a couple of questions. I think we've already talked about the wastewater treatment plant and whether that's having an effect. And in my view, the science is there's no way it can't be good. But will we see that signal or not? It depends on all the other stressors. Um, you also asked me about all the amazing contributions that um, Exeter has been giving to what's called the Piscataqua Region Monitoring Collaborative. So the Monitoring Collaborative has gone from, we used to get that $60,000, $70,000 from the municipalities. Since the permit came out, now we're getting over $400,000 a year from the municipalities. We also get funding from EPA, that's our main source of funding. We get funding from Department of Environmental Services and also from Great Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve. They do a lot of monitoring for us. But I'm told that the Municipal Alliance for Adaptive Management, also known as MAM, which is um, seven municipalities, Dover, Rochester, Portsmouth, et cetera, and now Exeter, that Exeter has contributed and will continue to contribute over $70,000 a year to monitoring. And Trevor and I can tell you that that is hugely important. And that allows us to do a lot of the things that you're seeing here, right? We can track seagrass, we can restore oysters, we can build that database, we can see how the water quality is changing over time. And, and it even helps us track impervious cover. We've used some of uh, Exeter's funding for that. So we're very, very grateful for the town of Exeter for helping us with that. And I believe we talked about that. Paul, did you have any other questions you wanted me to hit? Okay. So um, are there any other questions? Yes, sir. Let me, let me give you the microphone. I'm Dan from Exeter. My concern is uh, the wetlands and specifically the wetlands behind the dams that have been there for 350 years. There apparently is no requirement for an environmental impact statement for draining those wetlands. What is the impact on the estuary and other wildlife of draining those wetlands? I don't know. Yeah, I, I really don't. And I mean, draining wetlands is not is not a good thing. We wouldn't want to do that up and down the tributary system. Um, so the loss of the wetlands, we've already lost way too many wetlands. Wetlands uh, filter pollution. They provide excellent habitat for wildlife. 
So um, I think the impact is, is probably uh, significant. Um, so I think that's part of the difficult choices involved with the dam removal situation. It's like, no, that's a very difficult choice. So I don't know the answer to your question. And it's a good question. Are there, yes? Uh, let me get you the mic. Just following up on Dan's question, is there any study or any um, initiative looking into the, that balancing act of no wetlands but good um, dam removal? Any, anybody looking into that? I'll try and then I'll see what Trevor. Uh, I, I was actually speaking to a dam removal expert from the Nature Conservancy a couple of weeks ago, and oftentimes, you know, they have to do a lot of these preliminary studies before the dam comes out. Um, in most cases, um, you know, as you saw in that map of all those dam removals, the, the uh, positives associated with the dam removal seem to outweigh, in the scientific view, the negatives that are certainly there. But it, it really is a case-by-case -case basis. But I don't know if you have anything specific on that. Yes. On, uh, that's basically it. Yeah. So, Dan? Just to follow up on that. Um, I've got quite a bit of river frontage on the upper part of the extra river where they want to take out the old pickpocket dam. And both now and when they took out the town dam, I asked, what is the impact? You know, don't they have to file an impact statement? And there is no requirement of an examination and an impact statement for removing a dam. Certainly there is if you do almost anything else concerning wetland. Right. But these are exempt. And uh, something screwy, from my point of view. <laughs> and again, this is not my, as Paul noted as we started, we are non-regulatory, so I'm probably not the best person to answer this question, but Kristen. Um, Dan, I'm happy to share with you the dam removal feasibil feasibility study. It did quantify and model um, wetlands that would be impacted, and we did receive a wetland permit for that process. So I would anticipate, should we get to that stage with pickpocket, the same data would be required. Oh. Hi, what's your name? Uh, Doug Eastman, uh, born and raised here in Exeter. Um, I love the photo of the Hampton estuary, um, which is my backyard, sort of. Been playing in that for years digging clams and things like that. It's kind of interesting, you mentioned, didn't mention anything about clams and the estuaries, which are, um, in my opinion, just as important as, as oysters. Um, and um, the clams have been struggling for years, as we all know, but um, I think sustainability is cap capable of sustaining what we have now, but regulating the amount of people that are digging now is just astronomical. I mean, it's, you know, on Saturdays, uh, they limit it just to Saturdays now, provided that there hasn't been a lot of rainfall um, in the previous few days. So, but on any given Saturday during the clamming season, there could be upwards of two or 300 people out there. So. Did you have more to say? I didn't no, no, thank you very much. Just curious to, let everybody know that clams are very important, as well as oysters. I completely agree. Um, there's all sorts of different shellfish out there, razor clams, hard shell clams, uh, which I think you're referring to, the Maya Arinare. Um, Trevor went out like a couple of months ago, and someone had been leading us to believe that there weren't going to be a lot of people out on the flats. And this was like late February, early March, where it's really freaking cold. And there were a lot, according to Trevor, there was a lot of people out there. So this is a really important resource, both from a societal, cultural standpoint, but also uh, ecologically. I mean, they're providing the same, um, you know, habitat, water filtration. Um, they're more susceptible in some ways to um, different stressors. They're not susceptible to the disease that's limiting the lifespan of oysters in Great Bay, um, which is uh, Dermo. Is Dermo the one that is exploding with water temperature, or is that MSX? Dermo. So there's two parasites that are limiting the lifespan of oysters. They used to live an average of 10 to 13 years. Now they don't live longer than five. And that's because of these parasites. It used to be MSX, and now it's Dermo, because Dermo does really well in warm water. Um, 
But clams do fight in actual, they, there is a cancer that is specific, an infectious cancer that is, uh, that's called neoplasia. And it's in your document, which uh, I actually looked up the, I did a little work instead of giving it to Trevor. I, I looked it up myself. Uh, <laughs> Page 88, uh, there's a nice section on clams, and, <laughs> and um, they talk about some of the stressors there. So warm temperatures, toxic contaminants, green crabs are a huge stressor. Um, one of the best experts around is Brian Beal, is it, Trevor, of Maine? Brian Beal is the expert on clams in Maine, and he will tell you that green crabs just have a, a tendency to decimate. Um, you can get a really nice set of, uh, of larvae, and and, but then the green crabs will come in and decimate them. So um, we're working on that. In fact, we have, what do we have in the budget? $20,000? $20,000 to try to think a little bit more because our monitoring right now is fairly basic, right? The size class, how are they doing? But we want to do more about well, why are they struggling as much and how much of this is because of the harvest pressure versus other things. So maybe Doug is somebody, Trevor, you could contact as you get into that. Yeah, great. Oh, great. Great. That'd be great. Yeah, good. I see what's going on Yeah. Well, that's what we need. And, and Trevor and I don't spend a lot of time out there, so that would be fantastic. Yeah. Other questions? Uh, I, this woman, and then we'll go back to Mary. Dan, do you want to hand this to the woman? Hi, Robin from Exeter. Do we have any initiatives going on for planting eel grasses? I know they're doing that in Virginia and Maryland. I'm going to hand the, the microphone to Trevor. All right, finally. Finally, stand up, Wait, sir. Stand up. <laughs> hey, all. Um, yes, Robin, to, to answer your question, yeah. So, uh, Kala mentioned the Municipal Alliance for Adaptive Management, the group of seven uh, municipalities that are that are really bonded together and and working collaboratively for this. Um, through congressionally delegated spending uh, funding, they have um, got a uh, NOAA grant for that. So I am personally working with uh, Ray Grizzle and David uh, Burdick out of UNH to do an integrated oyster and eelgrass restoration project this year and next. Uh, you can probably still see the tan lines of my wetsuit on my wrists. I've been out there on the boat every day since the beginning of May. Um, it's it's really muddy out there. It's it's pretty bad out there. So we're we're really trying, but there are uh, ongoing restoration attempts, and we'll be we'll be continuing. And as part of my role as habitat manager with Prep, I'm really looking to take a, a spearheading role in uh, eelgrass restoration specifically. It's super challenging. I mean, the old way of doing it is you literally rip out an adult plant and then you go somewhere else and you push it into the sediment and hope that it, the roots grab on and it grows. And even in the best cases, it, a lot of the eelgrass just doesn't survive for one reason or another because it's stressed. Um, but sometimes it works. And some people have said, well, let's, let's move to um, just dropping seed. You can actually grow eelgrass seed and um, just drop it off the side of the boat or something like that. Uh, in some respects, it can be less work, um, less scuba time, less expensive. And I think Trevor is also going to be looking into that as well. So that's actually what I did my master's on back in the 90s, was, was, was doing that sort of work. So it's been around for a long time. We thought the timing was right, that the water quality was going to be good enough. And essentially, what you need for eelgrass to survive is really good light. But as Trevor said, I mean, we had a meeting yesterday. We're having trouble monitoring the eelgrass because the water is so turbid that you'll go down. I went down two weeks ago, and we basically had to link arms, me and my buddy, because otherwise we wouldn't have been able to see each other. And then our faces were about eight inches from the ground. And so if you wanted to like measure how tall the plant was, you're kind of like going like this and going up it because you just have no visibility. And so this year has been really bad, and I think it's because of all the rain. Um, so it's, it's challenging. It's just challenging. Um, other questions? Yes, Mary. So, uh, I'm new, so this is kind of an ocean question. Chicken and egg. Um, apparently there's some 
bacteria on the beaches. So what are the contributing factors to that? And back to the estuaries, what impact does that have on the estuaries? Did you want to oh, no. <laughs> take that? <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I wonder if you're referring, when you say bacteria, if you're referring to harmful algal blooms, is that possible? So plankton, uh, like a toxic plankton? You know, I saw a few stories on the internet mm -hmm. of the beaches being closed or people being warned. So it, it, it could be a number of things. So I'll, I'll speak to... Okay, I was going to speak to cyanobacteria. So if it's not that, it might be some sort of toxic algae. Um, and a lot of this work is... Page 92. Yep, page, <laughs> page 92, beach advisories, which is weird because beach advisories up to five years ago was a very nice trend, and suddenly we have a lot more beach advisories than we've had in the last 10, 15 years. It's, one of the, it's in the red zone, right? It's one of the few places where, and it, it's unclear what that's about. If you follow the news, sometimes you see that Florida is constantly dealing with these toxic algae issues. If you talk to Chris Nash, who runs the shellfish program here in New Hampshire, he'll tell you those problems down there are coming our way. And again, it's, it has to do with water temperature. And there's a lot of things that are, play, that are at play there. Um, sometimes these toxic algae blooms are being affected by things we have no control over. Um, th there was this huge bloom last year that they finally, <laughs> I know I had said that you could never like, um, you know, find the, the, the one suspect, they were able to in this case, and it came down to a huge storm in the Sahara Desert. I'm serious. I read the paper and it made sense, but I, I don't know if I could tell you, but basically because of this huge storm in the Sahara Desert, some limiting metal was being put into the, the ocean currents and made its way to Florida and was just enough to spur an algae growth. But the thing is, is you, they still are going to need enough nutrient to sustain a bloom like that. So everything that we can do to bring nutrients down will mitigate that problem. That's not the cause. We're not the cause, but we can mitigate it again by bringing our nutrients down. Um, and so that's really how you manage toxic algae blooms. Thank God the shellfish program is really fantastic in monitoring it, and then they shut everything down, and so nobody's, very few people end up getting ill. So there's different kinds of uh, shellfish poisoning. There's diuretic, amnesiac, where you lose your memory, and paralytic, where you get paralysis. So the shellfish program is very, very good at preventing those issues. Are there other questions? So um, as you, to me, the way that we achieve our goals, protect our, our loved one with an undiagnosed illness, the way we do that is why being champions ourselves. And so if you ever want to talk to me or Trevor, um, I, th I think we have a good record of being very available and talking. And, and um, if there's anything we can do, we might also reach out to you and, and ask for your advice on how we can um, address this issue together. But I really appreciate your time today. And let's just, um, let's, let's stay at it. Uh, I, yes, it's a huge challenge. Uh, I just read this quote the other day in the Washington Post. I don't know who said it, but he said, um, or she, optimists and pessimists both die the same way, but optimists live better. <laughs> so, so I will say, yeah, things are hard, but if we're not going at this with, with positivity and hope, then we're really screwed. So let's keep at it. and. Uh, and I know that there are case studies around the world where people have been able to make a, ch a change. So let's, let's keep at it. So thank you so much for your time today. And Trevor. Can I say a couple of things? You can close it out. I, I mean, I hate to follow after that because I think that was really well done. I really want to thank Kyle again for sort of really putting um, a real big emphasis and, and sort of looking at this from the 10,000 foot view, which I think as part of my job, we are blessed to be able to do. I love my job as Habitat Program Manager. I get to look at this from a watershed perspective and really think about it. But when I take my hat off at the end of the day professionally, I come back here and live in Exeter. 
I have been a resident for over six years. My son, who is six years old, uh, goes to Main Street School. Like, I come back and think this community. And I can tell you that I am always so proud. I work as the vice chair on the Conservation Commission here. I sit on the River Advisory Committee. I work with a lot of you in this room. And I can tell you that we do fantastic work. I can tell you that our, our con level of conservation lands is way up there. We're, we're like one of the top 10 in this watershed. Um, conservation focus areas, we have high percentages on. The dam removal that went through, that was a little bit before my time, but I can tell you that we are seeing those river herring come back, as Kala mentioned. We had 175,000 when, when we made that graph, and Fish and Game have told me that we nearly doubled it the year after. So like we are seeing real big effects because of all the great work we do. On the flip side of that, we still have to be cognizant of the fact that we're, we're striking this balance. We do have the top 10 impervious cover in the watershed as well. We've just gone over that threshold, as Kala mentioned. Like, we've been like sort of dancing around it for the last few years, and by the time of this report, we did go over it. We can't make development the enemy here either. We are not against it. We have to smartly develop. We develop smart, and you hold people to regulations that we know make sense in this community because we do a really great job here and everyone in this watershed is affected by everyone else's actions and we have to do the best we can here in Exeter and I think we really do. So I just want to again thank Kala for coming in and thank you all for being here and please if you have any questions let us know. Thanks Paul, did you want to close us out? You're good? Okay, thanks everybody. Thank you for tuning in to Exeter TV. Exeter TV is the town's public and government access channels, available on Comcast channels 98 and 22. Channel 98 is your channel. If you have an idea for a program, want to host your own talk show, or submit a film, we're here to get your content on television. On Channel 22, we bring you live and replay coverage of government meetings and other town updates. A third channel, Blue Hawk Media, is operated by SAU 16 and can be found on Channel 13 with all your school sports, events, and meetings. You can watch Exeter TV online at exeternh.tv, Apple TV, and on Roku. Find us on social media for extra content. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell to get notified about live streams and new content. Tune in to our platforms every other Friday to watch the Exeter Bi-Weekly Report with recaps of recent events, updates from town departments, and messages from nonprofits in your area. If you head to our website, exeternh.tv, we invite you to sign up to our newsletter to receive monthly updates about new content, upcoming meetings, and more. We'd like to thank you for taking the time to watch Exeter TV and hope that you tune in to our other content as well.